Hope you're doing well this morning. I'm going to start uh, the teach today with a story. It's a real true story, life and death kind of story. Uh, you may or may not know of the acrobat and tightrope walker Charles Blondin, but in 1859, in the summer, he became the first person to walk a tightrope across Niagara Falls. And, and it was an amazing feat, 25,000 people, it was estimated, came uh, to see him do this, to, to risk his life. Uh, he was only about 150 feet up above uh, the whirlpool there at the base of the falls. Uh, he made it, and uh, the next month, uh, more crowds came out because he was going to walk backwards from the U.S. side to the Canadian side. So he walks backwards across the tightrope, and then a little bit later, he comes walking back across the tightrope, pushing a wheelbarrow. He comes to the American side, there's a crowd there, and then he asks for some group participation. He says, do you believe that I can put a person in this wheelbarrow and I can push them and wheel them all the way across to the Canadian side? And so the crowd, I mean, you know, they're excited. They think this guy's awesome. And they're like, we believe you can do it. You're amazing. You can push somebody in a wheelbarrow. We believe it. And of course, you know where this is going, right? <laughs> he said, who's going to get in? The wheelbarrow. They all went quiet. Nobody got in the wheelbarrow. So their belief in Charles Blondin wasn't enough for them to actually risk their lives uh, for that belief. But there was a true believer. In August of that same summer, his manager, Harry Culcord, climbed on Blondin's back and was carried across the falls. He was a true believer. Why am I opening with this story? Because this is a biblical picture of what belief in Jesus looks like. And as we've been going through John's gospel, John has been very, very intentional telling stories of the amazing things that Jesus did, the things that he taught, so that his readers would put their faith in Jesus, uh, just like, like this, to actually follow him with our whole being, get in the wheelbarrow with him. I want to remind us of something uh, that Chad Holmes, in his powerful message a couple of weeks ago, he said, Chad said, let's get real. This isn't some trivial thing. Christianity isn't a hobby to improve your life. This truth about Jesus is a matter of life and death. And so the apostle John, when he is saying believe in Jesus, it's not the type of belief that that crowd uh, had in Charles Blondin, uh, but it's the belief that you go all in with Jesus because it's a matter of life and death that you trust him uh, with forgiveness of sin, that he's the only way to the Father. And also, that when it comes to Jesus and his life and his teaching, that we believe that he is the master of life. He's the smartest person in the room. And we say, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. I'm gonna follow your way. And, and that, that thing that I'm saying, that, that is something that our modern church, a lot of folks, they, they have a disconnect with. They'll say, I trust Jesus to get me into heaven when I die, but I'd rather trust myself in how I live before I get there. This is like saying, I trust my doctor, but you don't follow any of his prescriptions. <laughs> really, that means you don't trust your doctor. Are you with me? So the reason I'm setting this up is because we're going to see in the miracle of Lazarus coming out of the tomb that many people put their faith and their belief in Jesus. Uh, this is where, I'll just tell you where we kind of left off last week. Lee uh, left us with Lazarus being raised from the dead, uh, and there were many in the crowd that believed, but there were many in the crowd who didn't believe as well. And the thing that we're going to see set up today and what happens after Lazarus comes out of the tomb is this contrast between life and death. 
And, and it's a contrast, not just for Lazarus actually coming out of the tomb, but it's Jesus as he is on a trajectory to go into the tomb. I really love what the late Timothy Keller uh, had to say about this. He writes this, he says, after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, his enemy said, now he has to go. He's the most dangerous person there is. We've got to get rid of him now. Don't you think that Jesus knew that when he raised Lazarus from the dead? Yes, he did. He knew that the only way to interrupt Lazarus' funeral was to cause his own. The only way to bring Lazarus out of the grave was to bury himself. He knew that. And so Jesus, in essence, with this last great miracle of, of raising Lazarus from the dead, he knew in essence he's signing his own death warrant because he knew how the religious leaders were going to take that miracle uh, and what it was going to produce, which we're going to see in the text this morning. So as, as we're uh, getting ready to uh, look at the story, open your Bibles, if you would, to John chapter 11. And we're going to pick it up today in verse 45. What I want to do is I want to tell you we're going to see four things uh, in the text this morning. First, we're going to look at the faith response. That's going to be uh, John 11, verse 45. Then we're going to see the fear response to this miracle of Lazarus. That's going to be John 11, 46 through 50, and 53 and 54. And then we're going to see God's response. And I believe that we need to look at this because it fits the overall story uh, and the narrative where this is uh, taking place. That's going to be verses 51 and 52. And lastly is going to be our response, uh, how this hits us. So uh, open your Bibles to John chapter 11. We're going to pick it up in verse 45. It says, Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary had seen what Jesus did, and they believed in him. So, so there are a lot of people who are believing in Jesus because of his miracles he's been doing in towns and villages all over Judea, Samaria. But these believers are those that came out to basically mourn with Mary and Martha the death of Lazarus. And Lee mentioned this last week. This was, uh, I guess, a common thing. In ancient Near East culture, they would hire professional mourners uh, who would come. I, I don't know. It's kind of interesting. Maybe that was to boost the numbers. Maybe it was people who could really cut loose. You know, I don't know. But uh, but they came out uh, to to mourn, and and these people. Uh, who are believing today, maybe they, they were professional mourners, maybe they were just family and friends, um, but this amazing miracle convinced them to believe. So this was a celebration. I just want you to imagine the joy. I mean, first you've got a dead guy who comes out of the grave, and then you have a whole bunch of spiritually dead people they are made alive because of Jesus. So this is a party. I mean, just imagine, it's like an after party after a funeral. Uh, the angels are rejoicing. It's amazing. But not everybody was happy. Some people were furious, murderously furious, as we're going to see. Uh, let's look at the second response now, the fear response. Chapter 11, verse 46. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So... While the funeral after party is going on, uh, some of them, they go and they tattle like fourth graders, right? I mean, they, they're just like, Jesus did this thing. Uh, they rat him out to the Pharisees. And, uh, and then I think this, after this miracle, this is where it really just hits home for the religious leaders. They go, okay, enough is enough. Things are completely out of hand. If we just let Jesus just keep doing miracles like this, everybody is gonna believe in him. And I think it hits them like a thunderbolt because they call an emergency session of the entire Jewish ruling council to deal with this, to see if they can do damage control. Let's, let's see what they do in here in verses 47 and 48. It says, then the chief priests and the Pharisees, they called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man, He's performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everybody will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and they will take away both our temple and our nation. And I don't want you to miss it here. In these verses, verses 47 and 48, their motives of their hearts are being exposed. So first they say, everybody's gonna believe in him. 
And so what they're, what they're meaning there is that people are going to believe that he is God's Messiah, promised to come as far back as Genesis chapter 3. And then they're thinking, okay, if people come to believe that Jesus is that guy, then everything's going to change. That, that means there's new management in town. And we've been in charge for a long time. And what if the Messiah, he's not happy with the way that we run things? Because uh, Jesus had obviously been very critical of them uh, in, in a lot of confrontations that we've been seeing in John. And so, so they're just saying here, they're going, if, if people believe in Jesus, we're going to lose our place. We're going to lose our privilege. We're going to lose our prominence. We're going to lose our control. Now, I need to just take a second, and I need to explain uh, who the Sanhedrin was. I think it, it's, it gives us insight here. Who is this Jewish ruling council, and why was this a big deal to them, losing control? So, so first of all, the Sanhedrin was made up of the heads of some of the most influential, prominent uh, families, the non-clergy uh, in, in the society there. So they were called elders or men of power. So they were part of the Sanhedrin. Also, you had the Pharisees. And the Pharisees, we, we know that they were the ones that made the rules, the religious rules, and they didn't like those rules to be messed with. And then you had the family of the high priests. And so uh, these folks were incredibly wealthy because of all the celebrations, all the festivals, all the sacrifices at the temple. They, they just made a killing off of that. You remember uh, earlier in John, Jesus flipping tables in the temple because of the corruption. So that was, that was what was going on. And then you had the aristocracy. So these were the Sadducees. These were the political secularists, and they were basically in cahoots with Rome. So this whole group, they made up the Sanhedrin. And so in, in what they're saying here, they're going, okay, if the Romans realize that we are losing control of the people because they're following some crazy religious zealot, then maybe the Romans are gonna come and they're gonna exercise their authority and they're really gonna put their boot down on us. And so in their hearts, in this meeting, you can just see the idols of themselves just rising up. You can see they want their position, they want control, they want power. And so they raise up to push Jesus down. And I don't want you to miss the irony here uh, that's happening in this story. It's very ironic. Um, First of all, that they think that Jesus is an idol, that they actually think that Jesus is a false god, and yet they're the ones that are clinging to idols in their hearts. Also, it's ironic that they actually recognize the logical uh, response to all of Jesus' miracles. They're like, okay, he's doing all these things, and so everybody is going to believe in him, and more and more and more people are going to follow him. And so they say, we've got to stop that. Uh, and so how did that go? <laughs> how'd, that, how'd that go? Well, here we all are, right? 2,000 miles and two, two, you know, two, 2,000 years later, believing in Jesus. Uh, so, so that's ironic. And here's another very sad irony, is that the very thing that they were afraid of happened. They, uh, I believe it was a form of judgment um, because they didn't recognize Jesus as the Messiah. In 70 AD, Rome actually invaded Jerusalem. And so they, they invaded, they reclaimed Jerusalem, and they destroyed the temple. And only a portion of the western wall of the temple was left standing. And, and that's what we know today as the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. As a result of this invasion, many of the Jews were scattered all over the Roman Empire. And so these religious leaders, in trying to hold on to all of these things, they lost it. And the last irony that I'm going to mention here, and I'm going to come back to it in our application, is that the ones who are opposing Jesus are actually doing God's will, meaning that as they're plotting Jesus' death, God is going to use the, the death of his son to reconcile the world to himself. And we're going to look at that in our application. Let's keep going in the text now. Uh, let's read verse 49. Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, he spoke up and he said, 
you guys know nothing at all. And, and I read this and, and I'm sorry, it's kind of low-key hilarious because basically he's like, you guys, you're not using your brains, right? In the South, we'd say, you guys are as dumb as a bag full of hammers, right? <laughs> he's, he's like, you guys, uh, you just don't, you're not thinking at all. And then look what he says in verse 50. He says, you don't realize that it's better for you that one man die for the people than for the whole nation to perish. So Caiaphas is like, you guys, think about it. It's a no brainer. Like we kill one guy or the Romans come and they kill us all. So, I mean, you go, okay, his logic kind of sounds, kind of sounds sound there. But, but again, this is premeditated murder that these religious leaders are talking about. Now, before I move on, can I just do just a little bit of nerdy archaeology? Because I love when archaeological discoveries prove the reliability of the Bible. So uh, archaeologists have found an Oshery box, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, that bears the name Joseph ben Caiaphas. It's inscribed on the side. And they've dated it to the first century. It's on display in the Israel Museum. And so if you don't know what these boxes were used for, uh, what families would do in the first century is, is they would put you in a family tomb or a cave and then, sorry, but you know, you would decompose. And then like a year later, your family would come in and they would sweep up the bones uh, and put them in one of these boxes and then it would stay in the tomb or in the cave. And so I just think it's really cool that here's this box. It has Caiaphas's name on it. It, it fits the date and the ordinateness of what you would expect if, if you had a, a high priest uh, being buried. So just, I think that's cool, little nerdy archeology span there. All right, now let's look at the results of the Jewish Council's emergency meeting, verses 53 and 54. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Therefore, Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the people of Judea. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the wilderness to a village called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. So here we have it. This is the setup of the final trajectory of Jesus, uh, last days on earth. All the signs have been given, all the chips are out, they're on the table, and Jesus knows what's coming. He knows where the Father and the Spirit are leading him, but it's not quite his time just yet because there are Old Testament prophecies, details that he's gonna fulfill, like, like we're gonna see uh, very soon, he, he comes into Jerusalem on a donkey, and he also, he has teaching that he needs to do with his disciples. Specifically, he's gonna talk a lot about the Holy Spirit, the helper, who's gonna come in his absence. So it's not quite his time yet, but it's rapidly approaching. So, so in our study of John's gospel, from, from today moving forward, we're gonna be looking at the last days and teachings and actions of Jesus on earth. Uh, I should just say, until he comes a second time, amen? Um, so this is where we're gonna, we're gonna be going in John's gospel. But now what I want to do is I want to segue into the third response, which is God's response to this whole thing. Because these verses here, especially 54, says they're plotting to take his life. It's sort of setting up this drama in the scriptures. It's like, who is going to prevail? Is it going to be God or is it going to be his enemies? And, and as I was studying this, I was thinking, okay, what if I... Let's say I was in Papua New Guinea and I'm in a tribe uh, and, and so our workers are, are going through the, the gospel of John and, and I don't know how it's gonna end and I get to verse 54 here, you would be like, how's it gonna work out? What's gonna happen to Jesus? And so let's look now at number three, God's response. How does God respond to human evil and corruption? And how does God respond when people try to manipulate and spin and cover up the truth of who Jesus is? Well, my thoughts go to a couple of answers. His first response, God's first response to human evil is he dies for it. This is his response. Because of his great love for us, the pinnacle of his creation, humanity, the God of the universe lays down his life so that we can be rescued from evil. And Caiaphas' own words in verse 50 
They're an echo of Jesus' words in Mark 10, verse 45. Jesus says, for even the son of man, he did not come to be served, but to serve. He is the divine servant. And he comes to give his life as a ransom for many. And, and this is a beautiful truth, actually, that's sandwiched right in the middle of this whole ordeal in John 11. I want us to look at two verses that, that I haven't covered yet. I kind of jumped over them. I want to go back to verses 51 and 52 in John 11. And this is talking about Caiaphas' own words in verse 50. It says, he did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God, to bring them together and make them one. So unbeknownst to Caiaphas, and it it didn't impact him, he is actually speaking out words of prophecy here. And, And what he's saying is an echo of a series of prophecies that were given some 400 years earlier by the prophet Isaiah. And so Bible scholars call these, these prophecies, this set of prophecies, they call them the servant songs. And, and I wish I had time to just put just all the, all, there's so much in Isaiah about Jesus, but I just have a couple of verses uh, I want to point to. Isaiah 49, verse 6 says, I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation will reach the ends of the earth. So, so God has his sights, the, the servant has his sights on the entire world, the Jews and the non-Jews, the Gentiles. How is he going to do this? How is he gonna gather them together? He's gonna die for it. Isaiah 53 verse five says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed and so surely John in verses 51 and 52 he's thinking about and referencing Isaiah here uh, the divine servant now what is God's response to human evil and corruption particularly those who are trying to cover up the truth of of the son of God and and his his gospel and spreading what's God's response to that Well, we can see his response in Psalms 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth, they set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed. Does this sound like Caiaphas and his crew that are plotting? Say yes. Uh, This is is absolutely Caiaphas. And uh, and they're, they're plotting, they're scheming. But the psalmist here, he's like, this is crazy. He's like, like what do they possibly think that they're going to accomplish here uh, with their plotting and their scheming? And, and do they really think that they can overthrow God and, and his authority and, and that God is somehow threatened by this? This is like the question that the psalmist is, is posing here. And then he writes out God's response to all of it in verse four. It says, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. So what does God do? He laughs. He says, you guys, you can't be serious. God's like, I hold all of history in the palms of my hands. And and I hold the future. And it's all gonna go exactly as I have planned. And this is what we see just throughout history is that God is working his plan in the earth and, and at times, God does it. He actually chooses to work through uh, even the corruption of human evil. I want you to think about this. Like, remember when we did our Joseph series? It was like God was working. His hand was moving circumstances, even through, like, the brothers and their evil, even through Potiphar's wife. God was working to get Joseph into a position where he could become second in command over all of Egypt. And then you see another Pharaoh who rises up uh, after that and he hardens his heart against God and God uses that to display his glory uh, to the world. And then the ultimate good that we see from Caiaphas and his group of God opposers is, is our salvation, our redemption through the cross of Jesus. 
This reminds me of a song that we sing here sometimes. And, and it's the song, Who Can Stop the Lord Almighty? And the answer is, come on, no one. You can't stop the Lord Almighty. So now what I want to do is I want to talk about uh, the final response, which is our response. What is going to be our response to the works and the words of Jesus? Are we going to believe or are we going to resist? And then I also think about the idols that just rose up in these leaders' hearts. And it actually, they hardened these guys and they missed seeing Jesus for who he really was. And sometimes I wonder, do we have idols in our hearts that are in danger of, uh, of hardening us? And then how are we going to respond where we see opposition to Jesus just, start, just surrounding us? It just seems like there are more and more people who are opposed to Jesus. How are we gonna live in these, these days? Uh, so here's what I wanna do. I wanna suggest a few responses. First is that we hold onto our hope in turbulent times. We hold on to our hope, and I think this is relevant here, again, because we just look around and, and we go, man, it just seems like the world is just getting darker and darker and, and more opposition to Jesus. And so I think that, that one of the ways we need to encourage ourselves in the Lord is that we think about the story of Jesus and his trajectory and where his kingdom is going. And, and I love, there's just a lot of scripture that I could point to to talk about the story of Jesus and, and his trajectory. Uh, I just wanna share one of my Old Testament favorites out of Daniel chapter seven, uh, because what Daniel has is he has a vision at night of Jesus and his kingdom. And I want, us to, I want us to look at it. So Daniel seven verses 13 and 14 says, I saw in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him, Jesus, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. So in the times that we live in, we just have to continue to look at our king and his kingdom and where it's going and have hope because he is a promise-keeping God and it's gonna go just as he's planned. He holds all of history, he holds you, he holds me, and he's not gonna drop us. I think I need to lean in here just for a second and talk about this hope, especially as we're going into an election cycle. And, and I don't want to be political here. I'm not trying to be. Uh, yes, do your civic duty and vote in November. But here's the deal. Whatever happens in November, it's not going to derail God and his kingdom. Amen? It's not going to happen. He's still going to be on the throne. He's still going to be working his good plans in the earth. So we need to hope in him. I, I want to borrow... Uh, a line from uh, one of my professors when I was in seminary. He's the author, James Bryan Smith. And, and he had a phrase that I just say out loud sometimes. I actually was saying it this morning because sometimes you just feel shaky. You read the news, you look around, it's like, oh man. Um, and so I like to say this out loud because my, my brain needs to hear my mouth say it sometimes. I say this with as much faith as I can. I say, I am one in whom Christ dwells and delights, and I am living in his strong, unshakable kingdom. And I'll just remind myself and just say it out loud, and that brings rest to my soul. It's the rest that's described in Psalms 46, verse 10, where God says, be still, just be still, and know that I am God. I will be exalted in the nations, I'll be exalted in the earth. So. In addition to holding on to hope in turbulent times, our response also needs to be that we follow Jesus with our entire being. And what I mean by that is, is that he's at the center of everything we do and our life is like in the wheelbarrow. Like we are on his back like, and we're clinging to him for dear life. And, and he's reigning over our desires. He's reigning over our actions. We're living the with God life. And, and so another way of saying this is that Jesus is on the throne. He's on the throne of our hearts. 
And, and why is this an application? Well, I, I think this is what's going on with these religious leaders. And, and I read uh, verse 48 in the message paraphrase, and I think it really grabs us. Let's look at it. So the message paraphrase of verse uh, 48, chapter 11, says, what do we do now? They asked, this man keeps on doing things, creating God signs. I like that. Uh, if we let him go, pretty soon everyone will be believing in him. And the Romans will come and they'll remove what little power and privilege we still have. So what are they holding on to? They're holding on to power. They're holding on to control. They're holding on to privilege. Basically, they have self on the throne of their hearts. And what happens when you have something on the throne of your heart besides God? Well, what happens is that you begin to have a different ultimate. And what I mean by a different ultimate is, is that, that your heart just becomes set on things other than God. And, it, and it's subtle. It's just subtle over time. Things like, you know, just politics or sports. I mean, these are things that we, you know, we can enjoy money, stuff, um, but also like trying to control how people view us, our status. We just can become uh, obsessed with these things. And, and so whatever it is in our hearts that edges God out, uh, what happens as, as things start to edge God out of the throne of our hearts is we just slowly get hardened like these religious leaders did and ultimately end up opposing God. And this is what the apostle Paul experienced. I mean, he violently was opposed to Jesus until he met Jesus and everything changed. Um, but it's a mercy that Jesus actually confronted Paul. And it's a mercy that Jesus comes into our lives just on, on, on a weekly, daily basis that he comes to us through the conviction of the spirit. And he says, what's going on in your heart? What, what is your ultimate? And, I, and I, I love this, but it's so uncomfortable, but it's true that Jesus is a confronter. Like, just, like, you have to choose what you're going to do with Jesus because he just comes and, and, and he confronts the idols of our hearts. Uh, and, and so we need him to do this, to confront uh, what I call self-sins, self-sufficiency, self-pride, self-love, just the self-life. This is, the self-life is what our culture just makes the ultimate, says that's, that's what virtue is. Uh, but Jesus comes along. And he comes into our hearts and he says, you guys, I'm God, you're not. <laughs> I offer you life full and abundant with me and with others. But those idols of self, they're gonna have to come down. They're actually gonna need to be nailed to a cross. And then you can come and you can follow me. And that's basically a paraphrase of what Jesus said when he called disciples to follow him in Matthew 16, 24 and Mark 8, 34. So, I want us just to think about this in response this morning. Is there anything I'm holding on to, trying to hold on to? Is it prestige? Is it power? Is it maybe a, a career uh, or a hobby that, that's just kind of gotten out of hand and, and now it has taken the place of giving me meaning and identity and security apart from Jesus? And that's really the idle test. It's, it's, it's like, can I, can I do what I do in my life? Can I golf or fish or work or be a foodie, whatever it is, with Jesus? Or do my desires and my activities pull me away from him? So that's, that's the thing to consider. I want you to, as you're considering it, am I trying to hold on to anything? I want you to think about your heart like a garden. Uh, I, you know, some of us are gardeners and you know, you know that if you don't pull the weeds, uh, it gets out of hand. And, and so we just, we have to constantly check our hearts and go, are there weeds that need to be pulled? This is really what Proverbs 4.23 says, when it says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. And uh, this verse here is more than just something we say to college students, like, okay, sister, I know he's got blue eyes and big shoulders, but guard your heart, you know? Uh, I mean, yeah, maybe you need to there, but, but, uh, but really what this is, is talking about is we just need to be open to let God examine us, convict us, so we can confess, we can repent, we can pull weeds if we need to. Um, so I want you to think about that this morning. And lastly, um, I'm gonna end where Chad did a couple of weeks ago. Because Chad, he left us uh, really with this, this statement, we have to choose 
what we're going to do with Jesus. Because he doesn't give us an option, you know, kind of like a middle ground. When Jesus comes, he says, okay, are you going to get in the wheelbarrow with me? Or are you going to reject me? We have to choose what we're going to do with Jesus. Because this is where John, his entire gospel is going. It's kind of a get on, get off moment. Uh, what are you going to do with Jesus? And so this morning, you might be here and, and you might be like, you know, I've mentally agreed with Jesus, which is good. <laughs> um, but have you really trusted him with your entire life? Have you climbed on his back? Are you clinging to him as the only source of forgiveness, the only way to God? Um, if you have not done that and you're here this morning, I would just encourage you uh, just to pray before we're done because Jesus is here. So just talk to him and just say, Jesus, I'm all in with you. I do believe in you. Um, and I want to follow you and I want to trust you with my whole life. So um, you can pray right where you are or we're going to have prayer teams come up now. So if you're on the prayer team, I encourage you to just come on up. Uh, these, the folks on our prayer team will pray for you for anything. Um, so also, if you have believed in Jesus this morning, uh, you know that we, we have a ministry time. Uh, after the teach and there's communion tables that are spread around the room. So if you have believed in Jesus, communion is gonna be available. Uh, and let's just thank him. Let's just bring our hearts to him this morning. Um, let's, let's worship him. Let me pray for us. And then we'll move into our ministry time. Jesus, you're amazing. You are absolutely amazing and you're worth trusting in with our whole lives. And Lord, we want you on the throne of our hearts. So search us, search our hearts this morning and, and may our lives, may our desires, may they all be ordered under you and help us Lord to just weed uh, the garden of our hearts if we need to. And also help us Lord to put our hope in you when, when we feel shaky, when we look around, uh, help us to hope in you uh, that you are the king, you're on the throne, your kingdom is here, it's coming and we're living in it. We're living in your strong, unshakable kingdom, so help us to hold on to hope. We love you, and it's in your name we pray. I ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's move into our ministry time now.